your, uh, we've got a, a relatively big audience, uh, which uh, is indicative, I suppose, of how closely people have read uh, Nicola's work o over time. Uh, Nicola it was born in Paris and now lives in Washington with the Peter Institute, the Peter Institute, Peterson Institute. He also is one of the founding members of the Bruegel Institute in Brussels. Um, he's written very extensively, particularly on areas of around uh, financial system, finance, financial reform. So thanks a lot uh, for uh, first having me, uh, and uh, I think it's the third time I'm here at the Institute, and uh, uh, I'm very um, uh, honored, uh, not least because the previous two were very good discussions, and I'm looking forward to the discussion today. And, and that's actually the reason why I don't have a, a PowerPoint presentation, because I'll uh, keep my remarks, uh, in my initial remarks, pretty short, because I know that uh, we can uh, have a good uh, conversation with the group in this room. So, I guess the question is, uh, what does Brexit mean, right? Like in the seminar of the uh, UK government today, I think they have a, a brainstorming, uh, I read. Um, which will be very interesting, I'm sure, for those who participate. Uh, so, um, let me say a few things. Uh, I guess my main contention is that Brexit means hard Brexit. Uh, that uh, I don't see a space for membership of the single market outside of the EU for the United Kingdom or England or whatever uh, political entity ends up uh, being uh, the lever. Uh, why is that uh, not only or even not primarily because of the uh, often discussed issue of uh, free movement of labor and migration? I think much more broadly, the single market is portrayed, not least in the UK press, as a sort of free trade agreement, but it's much more than a free trade agreement. It is a supranational discipline, it always has been, it always will be. Uh, it has a supranational court, it has supranational enforcement. Actually, the more we go, the more supranational enforcement it will have. State financial services, which is the uh, area in, on, on, in which most of my research is. Uh, and uh, very few people know it, but the UK actually has accepted uh, supranational supervision of some financial institutions. Um, it's a very limited set of market segments, credit rating agencies and uh, derivative trade repositories. By the way, I should probably disclose that I'm an independent board member of one of the derivative trade repositories, the derivative uh, repository are aim of, uh, the arm of the UCCC. Um, but for those two market segments, ESMA, the European Securities and Markets Authority, uh, is the only supervisor in the European Union. And it supervises those two market segments also in the UK. Um, in spite of being based in Paris. Why those two market segments? Because they weren't supervised before the crisis. So there was no established basis and no uh, incumbent supervisors that would defend their turf, unlike for all the other supervised financial firms. Uh, but, uh, but this is just to give an illustration of the fact that the single market, particularly but not only in uh, regulated sectors like financial services is much, much more than a free trade agreement. And connected with this, um, a Brexit UK will not accept to be a member of the single market, even as leaving aside movement of people, they will not accept having to uh, comply with rules that others have decided, which is what you have to do if you're in the EEA. They will not accept the authority of the European Court of Justice. We saw that in the referendum campaign. They will not accept uh, European supranational agencies based on the continent having binding enforcement powers on UK entities. Uh, so for example, uh, to take the example I took, but this is micro examples, there are much bigger ones. Uh, so, um, if the UK was uh, in the single market, that's now would be the supervisor of some uh, financial firms into the UK. This is unacceptable for a, a UK, a Brexit UK, especially if you assume, as I would, that going forward there will be much more of that in the EU. Uh, what I'm mentioning for ESMA was unthinkable a decade ago. ESMA didn't exist, and the notion of supranational supervision was dismissed by everybody as sort of a utopian fantasy. Um, and I haven't even talked about banking unions here. I'm talking about capital markets uh, stuff. 
uh, and uh, we'll get much more of it. Uh, so, for example, if you think of financial market infrastructure, also probably some fund uh, regulation, maybe listing authorizations, etc. So, basically, to accept being in the single market without being in the EU, you have to be a country that accepts a lot of things, which typically are young countries. I mean, Norway became independent in 1905, as we were discussing at lunch, Iceland in 1944, Liechtenstein a bit before, but not much. Um, and, uh, and, and frankly, uh, I mean, being French, I think of the similarities between England and France, which are deeply rooted in history, and uh, the same way I couldn't imagine France accepting the discipline, I cannot imagine England. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, so basically, uh, that's, that's a very strong point because it organizes the discussion. If there is no space between being in the EU for the UK, between being in the EU and being outside of the single market, you have a polarization of outcomes uh, from the bulk of the current debate that still uh, recognizes what I believe is a fantasy, which is there is something in between. Uh, so that's the main point I wanted to make. Uh, as an introduction. Now, if you accept that polarization, that means that you can sort of play with a more limited number of scenarios than, again, what you uh, read in most of the debates these days. Uh, and, and I'm not saying there wouldn't be EEA for on a temporary basis. I'm just saying EEA or an EEA-like uh, solution is not something that can be permanent. Uh, so in terms of the permanent scenario, uh, well, you still have a scenario of reversal. I believe that would require a second referendum. It's certainly not on the cards now. Who knows what the political situation in the UK will be in one, two, three, four, five years. Uh, so I think that cannot be ruled out. And, uh, and that's important because that means that the number of firms which are in the UK will not make irreversible business decisions to leave the UK or downgrade the position of the UK in their global strategies until uh, the elimination of that reversal scenario. So basically we have a holding pattern, not for all economic agents, but for, for some, including some important economic agents, um, uh, because of the possibility of reversal. Uh, this applies probably to the large financial firms in the city. I think one reason why we have seen relatively little uh, decisions by large financial firms to reallocate future or existing investments uh, outside of London to the rest of the EU is precisely because they believe there is a distinct possibility of the exit decision being reversed, and in that case, it doesn't make sense to do the costly relocation or reallocation. Um, that's perverse, of course, because it means the downsides of Brexit don't materialize, which means the UK can continue to have a political debate by, based on the fantasy that Brexit can be painless. Uh, but, uh, but I think that's uh, a reality. Um, so, uh, life is perverse sometimes. Um, and um, the other scenario is hard Brexit, outside of the single market. Obviously, that's very disruptive for the UK economy, particularly for the City of London. And if you uh, do believe, like I do, that the City of London has been the main engine of UK growth uh, and prosperity over the last two decades, that has profound implications for the UK. Uh, of course, the city of London will remain the largest financial center in not only the EU, but in its time zone, um, broader time zone, uh, uh, EMEA, if you will, um, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, uh, for, the, for the foreseeable future, because it's so much ahead of any possible competitors. So even if you think the city declines in relative or even in absolute terms, and some new uh, competitors uh, take up very uh, uh, dynamically, even in that assumption, uh, it will take some time for the two lines to cross. Uh, so the, the city's dominance is not immediately challenged, but it challenges the city's dynamism and growth. And I think it would be severely challenged if the UK was to uh, confirm an exit from the single market. Why is that? Obviously, a number of activities are passport dependent, and they would have to migrate. Uh, but that's a relatively, it's an important but relatively uh, small uh, share of total activity of the large financial firms that define the city. It, it, let's say for the sake of argument that it's somewhere between 15 and 25 percent typically, which I think is not an entirely absurd order of magnitude. 
But the point is, if you, I mean, to, if you're the, 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 the UK affiliate of a large global financial firm, so let's say a US financial firm, it's a one-stop shop, right? You have, uh, you know, uh, J.P. Morgan International, City International, Goldman Sachs International, Morgan Stanley International, BlackRock International in the UK, and they, they do all sorts of different activities in that legal entity. So they mutualize a lot of uh, business lines, risks, exposures within that entity. Uh, and that's a network effect that has favored concentration of financial activity in the city very powerfully over the last two, three decades. So my contention here is that if you take a significant chunk out of it, uh, there's an incentive to take all of it uh, out of London because of the same network effect, because of the same powerful business incentive to locate a huge mix of activities in one single entity. I'm not saying in one single location, because it might be that these activities would be scattered in different places in the Eurozone or EU, but in one single uh, legal entity or business entity basically one supervised entity. Uh, and um, and if, if that's correct even partly, that means that this network effect that has been so powerful, basically the best friend of the city of London over the past two, three decades, would become the city's most implacable enemy. And the reason for that is that I cannot imagine that there is no single place in the uh, other 27 member states that uh, may compete with London to attract this sort of activities. In other terms, I'm not very bullish on Paris, I'm not hugely bullish on Frankfurt, but I think if you take them all together, including, of course, Dublin, but also uh, Luxembourg, Amsterdam, very important, Vienna, uh, Copenhagen, Stockholm, uh, Barcelona, uh, you name it, um, you will, uh, Edinburgh, if Scotland leaves the UK, but let's uh, talk about this separately, maybe, um, there will be at least one and probably several that can um, uh, eat uh, the city's lunch in that sense and, uh, and become the whole base for those uh, pan-European entities that currently are located uh, in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, so, so this argument about the network effect, I think, uh, is uh, what would make me lose more sleep if I was a Briton. Um, and of course, with the city come a number of professional services and a number of ripple effects. Uh, so, um, so I think the scenario of Brexit is a scenario of hard Brexit. It's a very negative scenario for the UK. Uh, it will take time for those points, which I'm sure will be uh, controversial here and not a matter of universal consensus. It will take time for those points to. Uh, uh, trickle down into the UK debate. Uh, and after all, if you believe that Article 50 may be uh, triggered in April 2017, which we know now is the very earliest possible date under current circumstances, only one fifth of the time has lapsed since the referendum of the period between the referendum result and the triggering of Article 50, which is to say it's very, very early days in the UK. A lot of things are going to happen. A lot of things already have happened that I think none of us could exactly predict. But a lot of things, including strange things, will happen uh, in the UK. Uh, the referendum result itself revealed <coughs> undercurrents in the UK public and, uh, and voting opinion uh, that surprised maybe not every one of us, but many of us. Uh, and uh, it is true that there was a campaign of lies but anybody who wanted to think through the consequences of Brexit had enough information available. And the fact that 50% of the voting uh, public went for an act of self-harm, uh, in my uh, view and in the view of many sort of, you know, uh, uh, experts, as uh, uh, Michael Goff called them, um, um, is, uh, is something that I think we have to take very seriously in terms of what that means for the UK as a, as a for the UK political dynamics going forward. In other terms, as uh, Philip Stevens wrote, I think, <coughs> in the FT on uh, in a string of articles before the vote, uh, the referendum was a test of whether the UK was still the pragmatic nation that we think, or we used to think of it as being. Uh, and at this point, the result of the test is that uh, it no longer is. So, um, so, what does that mean for the rest of Europe? 
there are all sorts of ideas and proposals floating around. I think the, the basic fact is that so far we haven't seen political contagion. So at this point, we haven't seen in any measurable way uh, the forces of Euroscepticism or anti-EU politics being strengthened uh, by the uh, UK referendum result. If anything, maybe the opposite, but the indicators are not very uh, reliable, but that there is no evidence of political contagion, which is something that might not have been taken for granted, and so that's a, an important post-referendum observation uh, that makes it even more likely that the uh, exit negotiation will, be, will happen without treaty change. The, the, the very likely position of the EU, even though there will always be this or that national leader saying otherwise, uh, will be uh, that treaty change may happen one day, but not before uh, the UK exit is negotiated. Uh, and that's very important in substance, because that rules out all sorts of fancy solutions you could think of. Because if you keep the current treaties, you really don't have that much margin. Uh, of uh, discretion in terms of uh, uh, the sort of uh, middle way scenarios between outside of the single market and inside the EU. Uh, so um, that means probably Article 50, even though that's not entirely certain, but I think it's very likely. And you know the features of Article 50, which is that once it's triggered, um, it's actually not good to be on the receiving end uh, or being the country. Article 50 is basically engineered to make life very painful uh, for the countries at least. Uh, so, um, so, so, so that's, uh, that's going to be uh, interesting. Uh, I don't see any indication at this point that there will be any great leap forward of integration into the EU as a reaction to Brexit, nor do I see any indication that there will be any great leap backward of disintegration or uh, uh, unraveling. Uh, uh, there are where forces of both integration and disintegration quite powerful in the period before the UK vote. To give only one example of integration, banking union is very transformational. Uh, we had the discussion uh, this morning at the central bank, and, uh, and I think banking union does make a difference, even though it's obviously not complete. Uh, and on the forces of disintegration, obviously they get related in the press, so I don't have to expand on this, but, uh, but, but basically. There is a rise of anti-system politics in the EU, as in much of the rest of the world, and this anti-system politics often takes a form of anti-EU, even so that's not <coughs> universal. Uh, so that's obviously a matter of concern for the EU itself. Um, and uh, even so, actually, when you look at it, the loss of trust in national governments is at least as big as the loss of trust in EU institutions. Uh, but there is a general loss of trust in institutions, and the EU has to take this as a threat. Uh, so, um, so, so, so I think for the EU, we can discuss this also at policy, and I'm happy to discuss especially those that relate to the financial sector, because that's my area of uh, specific focus. But for the EU, at this point, it's broadly business as usual. No revolution in the EU from Brexit, while Brexit is a revolutionary event in the UK. So there is a, an asymmetry. Uh, in, in the sense, um, and, uh, and that will color obviously the negotiation. Probably I should stop there and uh, 